Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. My point is I don't believe there is such a being. And I would say that's the flowering of the religious instinct within you. That, that stunned me when I first learned it as a proposition. In this video, we are going to watch two of the great minds of our time, Jordan Peterson and Stephen Fry, discuss God. Jordan Peterson confronts Stephen Fry about a passage from one of his books that is a rather common objective from atheists about religion. So we're going to have a more philosophical discussion about these ideas, whilst I'm also going to pose a few genuine questions that I have for the audience that I'm trying to figure out myself. This is a fascinating, fascinating conversation. So let's get into it. Right. Okay. I'm going to read something and forgive me. No. I want to go here. You're face to face with God. <laughs> Bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you? Mm. How dare you create a world where there is such misery? That's not our fault. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean minded, stupid God who creates a world so full of injustice and pain? And then one more. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac. Ivan in the Brothers Karamazov. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Right. Now it's in, okay, so yes, what happens in the Brothers Karam Karamazov is that Ivan wins the argument. Yeah. But Elosha is the better person. Completely and, so. And, and we right, love right. him. So it's, yeah. It's a right. book so everyone it's very should read. I, I would urge right. everyone to read The Brothers Karamazov because I, I do think it's a work of genius. Okay, so this part is very important for the theme of the video. Jordan Peterson here mentions The Brothers Karamazov. This is a 19th century Dostoevsky novel where one of the characters, Ivan, is an intellectual atheist son. And then one of the other sons' name is Alyosha. And Alyosha is the religious son. And Peterson here says that Fry's narrative is representative of Ivan's worldview, which is true because that was about shaking your fist at God and being resentful about the suffering in the world. And therefore, Ivan, the main character, adopts an atheist worldview, whereas Alyosha does the opposite. And interestingly, in the book, as Jordan Peterson alludes to here, Ivan ends up living a very difficult and traumatic life, whereas Alyosha lives a good moral life. But even more interesting, Peterson here says that Ivan wins the argument, but Alyosha is a better person. And the reason I find this so interesting is because I believe that we're kind of seeing in today's day and age what Dostoevsky wrote about in 1880 playing out in somewhat of a societal level. In our modern world, atheism is winning the argument, especially with scientific developments and many people believing, falsely in my opinion, that science and religion are at odds with one another. And also in terms of our ever more anti-religious cultural discourse, and also the fracturing of the church. But just because it's winning the argument, does that make it better? I digress. But before we get there, guys, if you wouldn't mind chucking a like on the video and subscribing to the channel and also leaving me a comment, there's going to be lots of things to comment on with this one. That would be awesome. It really helps me in terms of YouTube pushing my content out to more and more people. Let's get into it. No, and I'm, I'm not and trying, I'm not course, really not trying to put you on the my, spot. My point is I don't believe there is such a being. But if there were, and he were the kind of being that has been worshipped and described by various religions around the world, monotheistic religions, then I would have many bones to pick with him. Um, but of course, I don't believe there is such a thing. But the the argument from evil, as it's known, is a, is a very old one, and, and it goes back through through the, through you know medieval religious figures as well as uh, later humanists that this idea that. Uh, uh, it is it is very hard to square this loving God who has a knowledge of every hair on our head and adores us and um, and adores little kittens, but he also, as I say, bone cancer in 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 children, but also life cycles of insects that whose whole aim is to burrow into the eyes of children in Africa and and lay their eggs there and cause blindness for those children. I mean, you could quite easily picture a universe in which there weren't such an animal and in which children were not sent blind with pain and horror by the various bugs and fungi, fungi and insects and viruses in the world. There's, there's it, it, a, it isn't there's necessary. A, there's a worm. To, 
there's a worm in Africa that burrows under the skin and it's long worm. And oh, yes. if you, you can pull it out with a pencil and wrap it, but it breaks, it's fragile. And then it gets infected. It's a terrible thing. And a doctor recently made it his life's work to eradicate that and did it successfully. Yeah. And so then I would, so I read what you wrote and um, I mean, I, I take it very seriously and, and I, it wasn't, I wasn't throwing it in your face. No, no. I, I brought it up actually because of what you said about Flaubert's attitude, you know, because what that lacks, what your statement lacks is exactly what Flaubert highlighted in that woman on her knees. And, and I'm not saying this is a simple solution, right? Yeah. And, 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 and I would say, so let's take the argument you made there. And to, there's, a, there's a direction that goes in that's nihilistic and resentful and vengeful and angry and all understandable. Yes. But to me, counter it doesn't look to me like there's anything good in it it looks like it's entirely counterproductive it 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 makes the problem it purports to uh have been generated by worse mm -hmm. and it, it so, it, so the then error. the question is what's the appropriate attitude given that the argument you make is actually an extraordinarily powerful argument and i don't know the answer to that but i but i do know i think that resentment and anger and even the motive that would make you want to say that to God himself, I think that's probably not helpful, <laughs> even though it's so, well, it, I came to that with great difficulty. I mean, I've had my reasons to be resentful and angry, especially recently, and because I'm suffering a lot of pain. Yeah. And yeah. it makes me resentful and angry and wanting to shake my fist. Yeah. But I found upon intense consideration that there was nothing in that that didn't make it worse and that therefore that must be wrong, even no, though I it's agree. justifiable, I right? Agree. An incredibly powerful moment there by Dr. Peterson. And for those of you who aren't aware, he went through a very difficult time in 2019 and 2020 where he was plagued by a series of unbelievably painful and unfortunate illnesses and actually he very nearly died and for that reason at that time it's moving to hear him discussing the notion of suffering because obviously that had been on his mind so much you can imagine that he was wrestling with how to confront that suffering and how to deal with it and this is something that the religious people have been wrestling with forever and you can understand why somebody would be deterred by the idea of religion because of all the suffering in the world, especially somebody like Stephen Fry, who's clearly a very compassionate person and somebody who feels the world suffering in his heart and looks like he just bears the weight of the world suffering on his shoulders. And you might not know this about him, but he's actually a manic depressive and he has a fantastic documentary called The Secret Life of a Manic Depressive, which gives an amazing insight into the man. But putting aside for the moment the nature of God and if God actually exists. The question that I actually want to pose is, does it help to be resentful and thus turn our back on the teachings of the Bible? In my opinion, it's a resounding no. And all we have to do is look around at our modern world and we can see the sour fruits of a godless culture. Look at the depravity of what goes on in Hollywood and the satanic rituals being performed in front of our eyes regularly. Not to mention the destruction of the nuclear family and the indoctrination of college students into Marxist ideologies that have killed millions and millions of people. How about the brainwashing of children into mutilating their body or the widespread emasculation and demoralization of men and the demonization of femininity and motherhood and the list goes on. And if you disagree with me, then please feel free to let me know in the comments. But the way I see it is that as a society, the further away we move from God and religion, the closer we get to pure anarchy and degeneracy. And I'm most definitely not saying that atheists aren't good people and that they can't live good, moral and meaningful lives. And I'm a pretty socially liberal guy. I mean, I think you can do what you want in your personal life. However, it's pretty easy to observe that an untethered liberality tends to expand endlessly and reach some very dark and strange places. Moreover, I have to say that I fully understand Stephen Fry's point that's being elucidated here. If God is so good and he loves us so much and he's worthy of such praise and for us to turn our lives over to him, then why did he create things? 
things like bone cancer in children? Why are we such misery-laden creatures? Why does suffering of that magnitude exist? And furthermore, if he did create everything, then what kind of a sick-minded individual would even come up with such depravity? Why didn't God just make a universe where we don't have to suffer? And it's a fair point, and in times in my life where I've been really far down the path of atheism, I've had the exact same objections. And I can't really speak with any authority about the matter even now, because as much as it is something that I research a lot and do a lot of study into, it's also an area where I'm completely and utterly aware of my ignorance. And for that reason, I'm really looking forward to reading all of your comments. Now, let's listen to Jordan Peterson describe to Stephen Fry how the religious instinct is alive in him. Jordan, I completely understand. And you must remember that my response was to a question I didn't see coming. And it was amused. It, it was because I don't believe in this God. It's not an issue. I'm not really resentful and angry about the fact that there's evil in the world. I'm sorrowful very often, and I'm united in my admiration for the fact and the real belief I have that most people fundamentally, given this dysfunction or this deep trauma, most people are so good, are so anxious to be good, are, are deontically good, have a, have a sense of obligation and, and, and drive in them to be better than they are. I think that's, that's one of the key things I love about humanity is not just that we are dissatisfied with things that are wrong and can be improved, but that with ourselves we are dissatisfied and that most of us want to be better. I, I know that's true of me all the time. Every time I go off to sleep, I think, how did I screw up tonight, today? How can I be better tomorrow? Why am I so bad at this? If only I could manage that in, in moral terms, genuine moral terms. I, yes, I, I think that's genuine. an extraordinarily common experience so and too. very much under noticed. Yeah, yeah. And part of the reason, as far as I can tell, that the talks that I've been giving, let's say, have had the effect that they've had is because I do point out that that's an extraordinarily common experience yeah that 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 self torture by conscience and it does indicate um this striving towards a higher mode of being the other question i have when i look at the 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 response that that i just read is that the amount of the world's evil that's a consequence of our voluntary moral insufficiencies is indeterminate you know so you mm. might say hypothetically speaking that as part of God's creation, we actually have important work to do. And if we shirk it, the consequences are real. Yeah. And you might say, well, that's just an apology for God. And perhaps that's the case. And perhaps there's no God at all. And so what the hell are we talking about? But but I do think it's an important issue. I mean, your life is char characterized by a stellar level of constant productive creativity. That's that. That's you, and you're offering that to the world, and that seems necessary. And maybe it's because the problems are real and important, and and the role we have to play ethically is of paramount importance. Truly, yeah. Why else would we torture ourselves with conscience? And and I would say that's the flowering of the religious instinct within you. Well, the, you could describe it as that, but then, you know, there are phrases, I mean, you used a phrase earlier. So Stephen Fry does dodge that one just a little bit, but it's so interesting to watch Jordan Peterson be able to command such respect from these new age atheists that have had such an impact on our popular culture. How fascinating it would have been to see Jordan Peterson debate Christopher Hitchens. And for this particular one, I'd like to defer to the comments and everybody watching because I know that there are people who comment on these videos and who watch these videos that are orders of magnitude more educated than I am on this topic. And here's what I'd like to discuss. I understand what Peterson is talking about here in the sense that Stephen Fry is using dialectics to try and understand the world. He's more or less acting out the logos in his own way. And his own productive creativity is, as Peterson says, the flowering of the religious instinct within him. And I would have loved to have heard Stephen Fry answer that question and tell him why he's wrong there. Why is it that the aforementioned things are not predicated upon a religious instinct? And if not a religious instinct, then what is 
is it? And where does that come from? Perhaps somebody of the atheist persuasion would like to have a go at answering that one in the comments. Now for another fascinating exchange where these two geniuses discuss the notion of higher modes of being or higher modes of consciousness. I mean, you used a phrase earlier that I, I, I wanted to say, whoa, hang on, I'm not sure I know what that means, a higher mode of existence. Um, I, I don't that see... I remember having this argument with John Cleese, of all people, some years ago. <laughs> he, he, he's, he was a great lover of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and Gil Bran and people like that. And, and I've always found them slightly hard to take. And he talked about, a, he, I think the phrase he used was a higher level of consciousness. And I said, I don't, and again, this is my empiricist thing. It sounds cynical and skeptical. It, it's not meant to be, but w what level? Who's a, what? Describe a level. What is a higher mode? Why higher? What's higher than another? Are you saying it in terms of animals? Um, it's a view. It's an old fashioned Huxleyan view of evolution that most modern, uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, most modern evolutionary scientists and, and so on, the ethologists would, would deprecate to say that there is a higher level of being, a higher mode of consciousness. Is it just like saying, well, you're better educated, you've read more, you know more. Is it you've somehow been enlightened, uh, a Verklärungs effect, as the Germans would say, which is, um, uh, which is not necessarily intellectual, but is somehow spiritual? And uh, if so, where, show, show me an example of it. Show me someone who has a higher mode of existence than I do. Uh, or the, I, I can, I can answer that, I think, yeah, to the, some degree. Yeah, three the, ways, mm. three ways. One, that higher mode of existence is what your conscience tortures you for not attaining. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I think so what my conscience tortures me for not attaining is that I was rude to someone yesterday and I shouldn't have been. R right. But it's the shouldn't part of it. Yes. The obligation. It's the T. Exactly. Uh, David, well, then, David Hume, then, well, the, the problem of ought. Yeah. Well, and then you think, <laughs> you think, you think about how it manifests itself. Hmm. You don't, this is why Nietzsche was wrong. You cannot create your own values. Right. The values impose themselves on you independent of your will. Now, maybe there you partake. Well, that's what your conscience does. And good luck trying to control it. This is very anti-Nietzsche, isn't it? It's well, <laughs> I'm a great admirer. I know of you are. That's why I was. That's why reasons. I made the point. It's well, very well, opposite but, to his philosophy. But it's well. So Jung embarked on a lengthy critique of Nietzsche, and it's mm. part of his work that isn't well known, I would say. But and mm. we'll leave that be, except to say that the psychoanalysts, starting with Freud, well, not really, but popularized by Freud and systematized, showed that we weren't masters in our own psychological house. Right. There were, yeah. there were autonomous entities, yes. and those would be the Greek gods to some degree that operated within us, and we were... Which is we, Julian James's point, exactly, yes. Yeah. We're in, yes, yes, I'm, I have my problems with James, but yeah. as an overarching idea, there's interest in it. Yeah. Okay, so there are things happening with us and to us in the moral domain that we cannot control. Yeah. And that's a, that, that stunned me when I first learned it as a proposition. It's, oh, yes, look at that. Here's one. What are you interested in? Yeah. Well, that grips you. Okay. Number two, what does your conscience bother you about? Okay. Yeah. That's you're inadequate by your own standards. Mm -hmm. Now, what adequate would mean, that's a different question. Mm -hmm. But it's defined negatively by conscience. Yes. And then... Better. There's one up that I said I would lay out three. Mm. You can look at Jean Piaget's work on developmental psychology. On the development of the subject, yes. So, so now Piaget mm. looked specifically at the development of morality, mm. and he mm. was one of the first people to emphasize the importance of games. Yeah. And what he showed, what he showed was that at two years old, let's say, a child can only play a game with him or herself. Yeah. But at three. Both children can identify an aim and then share it in a fictional world. And so that's partly pre pretend play and the beginnings of drama yeah. and then cooperate and compete within that domain. Yeah. And then what happens and the game theorists have shown this is that games out of games, morality emerges. Yeah. There's a reset. So I'll give you an example. And this is a crucial example. So if you pair juvenile rats together, the males, mm -hmm. 
they have to play. They have to rough and tumble play because their prefrontal cortexes don't develop properly if they don't. Anyways, they have to play. You pair a big rat and a little rat, teenage rats together, and the big rat will stomp the little rat. Yeah. First, first encounter. So then you say power determines hierarchy. Yeah. Okay, but then you pair the rats multiple times, like 50. Yeah. Then if the big rat doesn't let the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat will stop inviting him to play. And so you get an emergent reciprocity, even at the level of the rat. Yeah, that and is it's, it's fascinating. Now, with that exchange, I believe Peterson is very much correct. And he got in with that first example in the sense that that exact thing that Stephen Fry was talking about, about beating himself up at nighttime before he goes to bed for his inadequacies, perfectly encapsulates what is meant by accessing higher modes of being. I mean, otherwise, why would we strive to do anything in life? Why would we read a book, travel to a new country, be a better husband, mother, friend, father, whatever it is, if there weren't some sort of higher modes of being that we could access? And interestingly enough, this is kind of Dr. Peterson's wheelhouse, because much of what he talks about in Maps of Meaning and the 12 Rules series is just that. The idea of going about your life in a certain way that allows you to become the best version of yourself, for lack of a better term. And I think that the scientific atheist types understandably have a bit of a tough time with this one, because it strays a little bit too far, perhaps, into the metaphysical. But also, individuals developing their consciousness or their modes of being, if you will, like a language or like a muscle, is manifestly observable in the natural world. So I hope you enjoyed philosophizing with me today, guys. If you want to reach me on any other socials or check out my other channels, hit that link at the top of the comments and in the bio. If you guys want to watch another video, click right here. Until next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.